Hi everyone, let's take a look at the third game from Bobby Fischer's book, My 60 Memorable Games. So Tigran Petrosian had the white pieces. This game was played in 1958 in the Interzonal Tournament. Fischer was 15 years old at the time. And five years after the game was played, um, you may know that Petrosian became world champion in 1963. So Fischer was up against uh, stiff competition here. Now, Petrosian was known as a very careful, positional player who would um, sometimes just bore his opponents to death, wait for them to make a mistake, and then pounce. He played very carefully, very precisely, and whenever his plans didn't work, he often just settled for a draw. So it was notoriously hard to uh, beat Petrosian in a game. He scored a lot of draws in his career. Um, anyway, um, the game opened with c4, an English opening, and Fisher went for his uh, favorite King's Indian setup here. Now, Petrosian was reluctant to push his d-pawn to d4, which if he had done at some point here would have transposed into a normal uh, mainline King's Indian. Like right here, if he had played d4 and black responds with e5, this would be a main position in the King's Indian defense. But instead, Petrosian pushes his pawn more modestly to d3. He plays more carefully. Um, and then Fisher responds with knight to h5. A typical idea in the King's Indian is to release this f pawn to come forward. Um, and now um, d4, strangely enough, came after knight to h5. And Petrosian reasons that uh, the knight is misplaced on the h file, and that gives white permission to waste that tempo of taking two moves to get the pawn to d4. Um, there was a previous game that Fisher was aware of that Petrosian had lost. Petrosian had this position as white before and tried rook to b1, but his opponent, and by the way, the point of rook to b1 is to push the pawn to b4, have it support it so that the queenside pawns could start rolling. Um, and his opponent played f5 and then queen to c2. And the point of that move is um, you can't push b4 now because the knight on c3 would be hanging. So the queen defends the knight, and now white is, white's idea is to push the pawn to b4. Black played a5 to contest the b4 square, but then Petrosian played a3 to further support that square. But then black played f4, and the, became, the game became very sharp here. Black got a lot of play, and Petrosian ended up losing that game. So in this game, Petrosian deviates and plays maybe more carefully here with d4. Now, Fisher plays the typical King's Indian move, e5, attacking white's center. And Petrosian decides to push the pawn forward. Um... Knight to e7 came, and then e4. And I noticed the engine really likes this position for white. White has all this extra central space because of his uh, more advanced pawns. But black does have his typical King's Indian break move with f5, attacking that white center. Now, Petrosian um, ended up taking on f5, and Fisher had a dilemma. What to recapture with? He had chosen the G pawn. He mentioned that it was very tempting. In his book, he said it was tempting him to capture with the knight. And he had worked out a lot of analysis after this move G4, forking the knights. And he says he would have moved his knight to D4, which puts pressure on F3. And we'll look at two moves here that Fisher was ready for. Um, one move would be knight takes D4 and then e takes d4 would come, hitting that knight while his knight is under attack. And so if white saves his knight with knight to e4, then Fisher would have played knight to f4. And black is fine in that position. I think black's actually doing pretty well. But instead of knight takes d4, what Fisher was worried about was g takes h5. And after that, he had planned bishop to g4, pinning the knight to the queen, and he has three attackers on that knight, 
and white has only two defenders, and white can't defend it anymore. So it looks like black is winning his piece back and has a good game. But what dissuaded Fisher from playing this line was this amazing queen sacrifice, knight takes d4, giving up the queen with the idea that the knight would sink into this beautiful outpost on e6, forking the heavy pieces there, and the queen would move somewhere, perhaps h4, to put pressure on f2. And instead of taking this rook, what white would probably do is knight takes d1. And here the knight stands well placed on e6, and white has three minor pieces for the queen. And the engine really loves this position for white. It says it's plus 1.8. So because of that queen sacrifice, that's why Fisher declined to play that capture, knight takes f5. So look how deeply these grandmasters, or Fisher wasn't even a grandmaster at the time, I don't think, or maybe he was, yeah, I guess he was. Um, look how deeply these players think into the position and what makes them decide what to capture with here. Anyway, he captures with the G pawn, and then um, there is a queen. There's a queen giving pressure to this uh, hanging knight over here on H5. So White has a free move with this knight, and he takes this central pawn. Now Fisher makes a desperado tactic and takes on G3 since his knight was under attack anyway. Um, I found it interesting that in the book uh, Fisher commented that. He is selling the knight's life as dearly as possible by taking that pawn on g3. And I've been reading Aaron Nimzowicz's book, My System, recently, and Nimzowicz uses that phrase, selling one's life as dearly as possible. So I'm guessing Fisher got that from that book. Um, anyway, white captured back with the h pawn, and then Fisher takes the knight with his bishop. Okay, so now... Um, f4 is played, and Fisher's pieces now start to get dominated. Um, White's pawns are looking really good here. The bishop retreats to g7, and if you look at some of these minor pieces, this bishop has no prospects. It can't really go anywhere. This knight has no prospects either. It's completely bottled in here. There's nowhere for it to go. Um, the only piece that's any good, the only minor piece that's any good is this bishop, and it's great on this diagonal, uh, which is why Petrosian decides to trade it off. He plays bishop to e3, heading for the d4 square. Um, bishop d7, developing, bishop d4. Now, knight to g6 was played, rook to e1. I suppose white is, is not really worried about this bishop evading capture over on this miserable h6 square, so white can exchange bishops at any time. Um, rook f7 was played, um, bishop f3. I think the point of this move, bishop to f3, was to stop the black pawn from coming to h5. Uh, Fisher remarked he should have probably pushed that pawn in the last last chance he had to trade it off for White's G pawn. Um, but anyway, uh, Queen to F8 came, and that's a kind of a mysterious move to me. I was thinking maybe Fisher was planning on capturing here and then playing his Queen to G7, um, just trying to trade off some pieces to relieve how cramped his position is. But he ends up changing plans, King to F2, Rook to e8, and the rooks get traded on the e-file, and then white finally takes that bishop on g7, the rook captures back. Uh, white centralizes the queen to a beautiful square uh, and attacks the a7 pawn here. So black pushes b6, and now rook h1, great file for that rook. Uh, a5, knight d1, rerouting the knight to uh, the e3 square where it can pressure that f5 pawn. Queen to f8, and again, I think that queen is headed for the g7 square. And I think it gets there this time. So knight e3, rook f7 uh, helps defend that pawn and vacates the g7 square. b3, queen g7, trying to trade queens. White says, okay, I'll go ahead and trade queens and then play a3, 
And at some point, White would like to break open on this side of the board and maybe get an open file for his rooks, for his rook. So White can play on both sides of the board here, the king side and queen side. And Black's minor pieces are still very bad. And so Black is in a lot of danger in this position. White is really squeezing him. Okay, rook f8. He wants to get the rook back to the 8th rank so it can swing over here and grab an open file in case um, Petrosian pushes his pawn to b4. Bishop to e2. He's rerouting this bishop to an even better square um, than it was on here. It's going to pressure this pawn. Okay, knight to e7. Bishop to d3. h6. Rook h5, and now there's a lot of focus on that square right there. Three attackers and three defenders. Now, Fisher plays bishop to e8, attacking the rook and removing one of the defenders of that f5 pawn. And he's setting a very cunning trap that Petrosian doesn't fall for. Petrosian retreats the rook to h2. Very careful player. Very tactically aware, even though he's a very slow positional player, he is a grandmaster and he knows his tactics. And this is the trap he avoided. It looks like white can take that pawn with knight takes f5, since it's with check. And if black, re if black captures the knight, then the rook can take, saving itself from the capture of the bishop. And this looks like it wins a pawn. I mean, what's black going to do here? Take the rook, get recaptured, and white's just up a pawn here. But no, Fisher had planned this devious trap. He would have played rook to h8, evading the trade of rooks there. And look at this rook. It's completely trapped. There's nowhere for that rook to go. Um, and Fisher is going to play bishop to g6 on the next move, winning the exchange. So that was a really nice little trap that Fisher had set with this move bishop to e8. So white retreats the rook. Um, bishop goes back to d7. Now the rook goes to h1 so it can swing over to the queen side at any time. Uh, rook h8. Knight c2. That knight is improving itself too. It was on a good square there pressuring that pawn. But wouldn't this square on d4 be even better? Still pressuring the pawn, but looking at these nice outposts here. So Petrosian's always doing that. He's making these little positional improvements throughout the game. Okay, king comes up to f6 to lend some support to f5. The knight comes into d4. Uh, king is just shuffling back and forth here, I suppose. Nothing for black to do. He's waiting. Bishop goes to e2. Um, knight to g8. Now that, that looks like a tempting move because you've got now a path into the game. You've got this outpost here in e4. But Fisher criticized himself for that move because it temporarily blocks in this rook. And that's the perfect time for Petrosian to play b4. Because now black can't exchange on b4 and then play his rook to the open a file. Because his knight just blocked it. Okay, so instead of exchanging, uh, Fisher plays knight f6, and now it looks like white might be able to grab an open file by exchanging on a5 and then bringing the rook to b1, but he can't really. Instead, he plays bishop to d3 to protect this e4 square. Fisher mentions that if he had tried that idea of opening the b file, then Fisher would have played knight to e4 check. And after the king moved, he would complete the capture, and the rook would come to the b-file. But then the knight's headed for the nice square on c5, and everything's under control now. All of these squares are in black's control, and white cannot invade with his rook. And the engine agrees that this position is like a dead draw. Okay, so instead of exchanging there, Petrosian correctly plays bishop to d3 first and controls that e4 square. Now, uh, black exchanges on b4, and then since his pawn on f5 is hanging here, he protects it with his king. He allows the rook to come over to the a-file, but he's going to be protecting things with his rook. The knight comes to g4 with check. Rook goes to the central file with check. Okay, the knight goes back to f6. The rook comes in. They dance around, and now this point is protected and attacked. 
Okay, now Fisher was completely surprised. It doesn't look like White can make any progress here, but he was completely surprised with this pawn sacrifice, c5. Okay, I don't think it's a winning sacrifice. The engine says it's plus 0 0.3 in this position, but it's probably the only way for White to get any play in the position and to make any progress. Um, Fisher takes the pawn with b takes c5. He mentions you can't take this pawn with the knight because this pawn would come forward and attack that bishop, and the only safe square is over here, but then bishop takes f5 check and wins the rook. So knight cannot take that pawn, so Fisher takes there, and white recaptures, and then Fisher goes up a pawn. Okay, but these are double isolated pawns, so being up a pawn is not so great. Okay, the knight comes to f3, threatening to come here, forking the bishop and the king. So the king moves over, um, still stepping into a fork, but then he's going to be protecting his bishop. Okay, knight e5 check, king e7, um, knight takes d7, knight takes d7, and then white wins the pawn back. And he's got some pressure on that knight, which is pinned to the rook. Okay, rook to f8 attacks the bishop, g4 defends it. Okay, king goes up, makes some progress here, attacks this pawn. And now um, bishop comes to, uh, bishop exchanges itself. So exchange of minor pieces, and we enter this rook and pawn endgame, which looks difficult for black to hold. These pawns over here look pretty good to me, and these look pretty bad to me. But the engine, in fact, the engine was really confused about this endgame for the next 10 or 20 moves here, however long it took. Um, the engine score often gave white like a plus 2.5 at depth 23, but then sometimes I increased the depth, and by the time it got to depth 27, it said, no, it's back to zeros. The engine was really confused in this endgame. I don't want to analyze it because it's beyond me. It's too difficult. In fact, at one point, Fisher mentioned that um, he was losing the endgame, and in fact, Petrosian had published a winning line that Petrosian had missed. He published a winning line in the Russian bulletin for this tournament. And when I checked his line with the engine, it was completely wrong, if the engine is to be believed. Uh, Petrosian's so-called winning line actually gave Black a score of negative 4.5 at one point. So it was a very difficult um, endgame to analyze. So let's just play through it. King comes up, rook to e8 check, uh, king to f3. So the point of this move, rook to e8, is to force this king to decide which way to go. If it goes over to d3, then black can attack that g pawn and win a pawn here. So Fisher is forcing that king away from his past c pawn. He's got that king cut off now from that past c pawn, and he says that should be enough to, to hold the game. Okay, king d6, rook a6 check, skewering the, the pawn over there, and uh, Petrosian has these dangerous connected past pawns. Okay, but the c pawn starts getting pushed, rook h1 goes back to defend. Yeah, here is where uh, Petrosian published his analysis and said rook h7 was winning. But I don't think it is, not according to the engine. And when I went through the analysis, that's where it said, no, no, actually black was winning in, in one, of the, one of the lines in the analysis. Um, and actually the engine says rook h1 is the best move. Uh, but it's probably completely drawn anyway. Uh, c3, g5, c5, rook d1 check, king hides, g6. So black, it's a, it's a complete race here. Black is going to win that rook. But white's dual pawns over there are too strong for black to win the game. So uh, black wins the rook here, but then there's just no way to stop these pawns. In fact, it looks dangerous. It looks like white might win this game, but black has everything under control, I think by a mere tempo or two. Um, after f7, uh, the game was agreed drawn, and so here's where I analyzed it. And I realized the simplest win, and I was, I was happy to find this myself without the engine, the simplest win that I found 
was rook takes g6 check because then this end game here is a is a known book draw and it's only because the pawn on the seventh rank here is a bishop pawn a pawn on a bishop file if it were on a rook file or a bishop file it would be a draw if it's on a central file or a knight file it would be a win for white so that's a drawn position. There probably were other ways to draw as well. So very exciting uh, draw between uh, Fisher and the future world champion Tigran Petrosian. All right, thanks for watching the video.